I want to say a couple of things today about um, the overall shape of the course before we get into the details of talking about the ideas of Marx and Lenin, who implements a form of Marxism in Russia. The overall pattern of this course really is a sort of grand fall and redemption story, okay? If in the original Garden of Eden the fall results from the knowledge of good and evil, you might say in this case it's the opposite. It's the loss of the knowledge of good and evil. The idea that norms in general, should, ought, right and wrong, just and unjust, and so on, get undermined by a certain vision. That undermining starts among a select group of intellectuals. It spreads to the rest of the population as a result of the disasters of World War I. And then the absence, the loss of norms, of a sense of right and wrong, of good and evil, or a radical reinterpretation of them, ends up making possible a series of devastating events throughout the middle part of the century. And then, gradually, especially after World War II, people begin to sense that they have encountered real evil and that there is such a thing as normativity, and it has to be brought back. And so people try to reconstruct some notion of good and bad, right and wrong, just and unjust. And much of the last part of the course is really going to be about that process of reconstruction. But right now, it's as if we're on the roller coaster and we just go, got over the top, and we're about to go down the big hill, okay? And the point of World War I, not the point of the war, the point of us discussing it last time, was precisely that that's the event that sent the roller coaster down the hill. Um, you had some sense that, all right, it's about to fall, but it's really that that shattered people's faith. Why? It was both that the war was so incredibly destructive, and last time I hope you, I gave you some sense of that, but also that it was so aimlessly, so pointlessly destructive. What were people fighting for? At the end of, the, of World War II and throughout the war, people had a strong sense of what they were fighting for. Even in retrospect, it is hard to identify what anybody in World War I was fighting for. What was the issue? Various sides tried to make an issue out of it, to make the world safe for democracy, for example. But actually, it wasn't a particularly ideological war. It wasn't something that anyone could look back on afterwards and say, well, at least all of those people died for a good purpose, for a good cause, in order to accomplish something big and great. Instead, it seemed like a lot of people lost their lives pointlessly. Not only pointlessly in the sense that battle strategies and things like that were idiotic, but also in the sense that the larger war seemed to have no purpose at all. And so what we're going to see today is one element of that collapse. I want to rewind to the 19th century and look at the philosophies of Karl Marx, and then see how they actually got implemented in Russia with the Russian Revolution in 1917. That interacts closely with the history of World War I, because in part it was Russia's withdrawal from the war that enabled Germany to concentrate its forces on the Western Front and enabled the battles there to become decisive with respect to the end of the war. In any case, we're going to be talking today primarily about Marx and Lenin. So let's start with the views of Karl Marx. Marxism is something that has a huge impact on the 20th century. You see here in red all of the countries that have been at one time or other Marxist throughout the 20th century. And that's a significant part of the world's population and surface area. Now, I want to rewind a little bit to talking about our two images, the manifest image and the scientific image. We've talked about those ideas in general. The manifest image is our everyday picture of the world. And in that picture, not only do we talk about ordinary objects, people, things, but we think of people as being free, rational agents, as making choices. We think about them doing the right thing or the wrong thing. We think about them having responsibility for their actions. But the level of the scientific image, all those odds are gone. They're not there anymore. And so we've got a purely descriptive is type version of the world rather than one that mixes is, ises and oughts. And what follows from this? Well, from a purely scientific version of the kind you inherit from the Enlightenment, nothing in particular follows about what ought to be done. Nobody can know or manipulate those connections. And so even if you think in the end what you think, what you desire, what you believe, what you entertain, um, what you, uh, you know, feel, ultimately comes down to molecular motions of a certain kind, well, it, it doesn't really matter. Nobody knows how to use that knowledge to do much of anything. Or if we do, it's only at a very general level of trying to administer certain drugs to alleviate certain psychological conditions. So none of that is very detailed. We don't know how to get to the level of manipulating any individual thoughts or desires or anything like that. 
But what if you thought you actually had a comprehensive knowledge of the basic level? And suppose you also thought you understood the way in which that base level was connected to the manifest image. Then you might think, aha, I've got the secret to manipulating the surface level. I can manipulate the base level. Now, in some ways, that's a plausible thought. After all, that's what psychiatrists actually do by prescribing psychoactive med medications. They think that something about the chemistry of the brain is actually affecting what kinds of thoughts people have, what kind of desires they have, and so on. And so they administer the medications to affect things going on at the scientific level that will then actually have an effect on the manifest level. So there's nothing by itself that's bizarre about this thought, but suppose you thought you could do it not only in a very specific way like that, but in a very general way. <coughs> then you might need, well, you might have a different conception of how things work. <coughs> and in particular, there's a danger here, because it might induce in you the pride, the hubris, that you actually understand things well enough to manipulate things according to your desired version of society. So you might think of this as not just a two-level theory, but a two-level a two-level conception of society. There are those who know the underlying causes and their connections to the manifest level, and those who don't. So in short, there are certain people who understand what's going on, understand the deep hidden causes of things, and those who don't. And you might call this a version of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the ancient doctrine that somehow salvation consists in knowledge. It's a matter of knowing something of a certain kind. And the modern Gnostic, thinks it's not some special knowledge of God or something like that, but instead a knowledge of this base level that enables you to attain salvation in the sense of manipulating society to get the outcomes you want. This might take a variety of versions, but the basic idea is the Gnostic thinks they understand those connections well enough to manipulate the manifest level by making interventions at the scientific level. And here's the way the story often goes. Societies right now are imperfect in various ways. People cause all sorts of harms. I mean, what are some things that are wrong with society now? I don't mean sort of deep hidden things, I mean kind of obvious things. What's wrong with us? Murder. Murder. Really? Rape. Pillage. <laughs> yeah, war. Destruction. There are lots of things that human beings do to other human beings. It seems really bad, right? And so you might think, well, this is terrible. Why do human beings treat each other so badly? Why? Aren't we actually living together as one big happy family? What goes wrong? Well, you might think, here's the problem. If we think of people purely at the level of the manifest image, then we realize people are making choices, and sometimes they make a bad, a bad choice. So we have to hold them responsible for that. We, in short, think in terms of choices, good and evil. But suppose we think of things in this Gnostic vision. We instead might think, well, people are free. They're doing what they're doing at the manifest level for reasons that have to do with these hidden causes. So, what if, given that people are driven by these forces that are hidden from them, we manipulate those forces. We find ways of intervening in that base level, that hidden level, and change things in such a way that people behave differently at the manifest level. So you might think, for example, that if you change social institutions, you can change, somehow, these background forces. Uh, if you make psychological interventions, you can do this. It depends on the nature of your background theory, your theory of this hidden base level. Yes? Is this at all a way of prerequisite to Borenstein Maitland's like institutionalism and his development of the United States? Like, what is that? Is it on this at all? Oh, okay, yes. Maitland is an interesting example. This institutionalism you refer to is a way of saying, yes, it's really a question of institutions. And so there are a variety of so social thinkers like Dublin, like Max Weber, and so on, who say really the hidden forces are to be identified at the level of social structures, social organizations. And later that becomes an anthropological theory known as structuralism. Claude Levi Strauss is a good example of the sort of person who thinks, yes, it's in terms of the structural organization of society, the way in which society is organized and our institutions are organized that is really crucial here. Freud ends up thinking it's a matter of unconscious psychological forces that determine this. And so maybe by intervening psychologically, you can make a difference. Um, as we'll see, Marx thinks the crucial determinants are really ultimately economic. And so it's really economic social institutions that have to be altered to make this, to bring this about. So there are a variety of ways in which this idea gets explored in the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century to really say there are certain hidden structures, psychological structures, sociological <coughs> structures, institutional structures, economic structures, and so on 
that are really critical. And if you change those, you will change the pattern of people's behavior. Not just because you've altered them in the obvious way, but because you will really change the underlying forces that affect what we desire, what we think, what we feel. So the idea is we just have to know how to do this. Well, there's a certain conflict, as soon as you mention it this way, with ideas of democracy, with ideas of liberty. For one thing, the idea of liberty seems to presuppose that people have free choices. But if nobody's behaving freely, if you're just a puppet controlled by these hidden forces, it doesn't seem to matter much whether we give you what is called political liberty, because after all, you aren't making free choices anyway. And democracy, who should lead here? It's not whoever these people vote for as a result of these hidden forces. It's rather a question of who understands the structure. And so this can naturally tempt the intellectuals who believe such a theory to think, aha, intellectuals should be in charge. Now this is actually an ancient thought. Plato thought that philosophers should be kings. <laughs> yes. How many are in favor of voting philosophers kings? I'm ready to accept the nomination. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's natural to think, oh, I understand what's going on. I understand what ought to be done. I know how to manipulate the base level. So put me in charge. And that is a temptation we're going to see throughout the 20th century. People basically saying, put me in power. I understand the hidden forces. I understand the underlying social structures. I can manipulate things in such a way as to bring about utopia. Usually the result is disaster, as we'll see. Sometimes less than disaster, but often disaster. Nevertheless, that's the idea. If I really understand these, then I can do things in such a way as to bring about the desired social outcome. And so there is a puzzle about this. You might think this is the key to bring about utopia, but remember that the manifest image is where all the oughts are. <laughs> That's where the shoulds are. That's where the ideas of right and wrong, just and unjust, virtue and vice are. Get rid of that and look at the base level, and what do you find? Just the is, right? There just are these social forces. There are these molecular motions. There are these institutional structures. There are these psychological structures. However you end up cashing this out, you just have the is. You don't have the off the base level. And so put these intellectuals who know this, supposedly, in charge, and what happens? Actually, they no longer have the norms to guide them. As a matter of fact, they suggest at the base level that those norms are really just covered for some other hidden force. And so the problem is, you might say, this vision relies on norms. Because after all, you're supposed to bring us to the promised land. You're supposed to produce the desired social outcome, the one that really ought to be brought about. But according to you, these ops are just nonsense. They're hidden social forces that are really just being manifested in certain ways. And so it undermines the very norms that you need to make the decisions. So in short, you put the intellectuals in charge to bring about this desirable outcome, but you also thereby remove any sense of what ought to be desired, what's worthy of being sought. And as a result, you get what Dostoevsky would consider the paradox of the anointed. That's my term for his concept. But you can see how it actually arises. The ones who are anointed who say, I know enough to be put in charge, they're also isolating themselves from the very norms they need to help them to make decisions, to identify that state that ought to be brought about, to identify the goods that are worthy of being desired and ought to be promoted by any social organization. And so the vision relies at certain points on people making decisions about what's better than what, about what ought to be done. But it also deprives you of any foundation for making those judgments. At the level that matters, this underlying hidden scientific level, these things don't exist at all. And so there's a kind of tension underlying the vision. And we're going to see that play out in the way that Marxism is actually put into practice. So let's look at Marx's view itself, and then we'll take a look at its implementation in Russia. Marx happened to be writing at a propitious time. It was the end of that first industrial revolution. People had been flood flooding into the cities. The result of that was <coughs> huge social disruption, a great deal of inequality, uh, noxious conditions in the cities as people were dealing with tremendous pollution, overcrowding, uh, unhealthy conditions, all sorts of difficulties. The result of that was revolution, really throughout Europe. The revolutions of 1848 took place in all those places marked on red in the map. And Marx begins the Communist Manifesto by saying, a specter is haunting Europe, and implies that all these revolutions are really communist revolutions in disguise. Well, of course, this was not true. These were taking place in 1848. The Communist Manifesto was published in 1848. <laughs> He's looking around saying, look at all these revolutions. Yes, I know, they're really revolutions 
and expressing my ideas at the time that he was publishing this. Nobody ever heard of communism or of his ideas. Maybe a few people reading his German newspaper had been. So to some extent, he's jumping on a bandwagon that's already rolling. Nevertheless, it does mean that social conditions are ripe for his ideas to get a hearing, and they certainly do. He was a prolific writer. Uh, you see here the, some of the Marx books I happen to have in my office. The writings of the young Marx on philosophy and society. He wrote a variety of things in newspapers and other contexts in the 1840s. Then, of course, the Communist Manifesto in 1848. A variety of other works, including ultimately uh, Das Kapital in several volumes in the 1860s. And he has memorialized in all sorts of things. Here he is carved in the, the side of a mountain. <laughs> now, Marx starts with what looks like classic enlightenment materialism, a version of this two-level theory in which the materials, the molecules, are moving around at the base level, and then conscious thinking is at the manifest level. And indeed, that is an idea that runs throughout most of his thought. He says, let's start with material reality, with economic conditions, with the scientific method. He says, I want to talk about real individuals, their activity and the material conditions under which they live both those which they find already existing and those produced by their activity. I want our premises to be verified in a purely empirical way. So he thinks of himself as carrying on a scientific tradition. And when he says they're the real individuals, he's contrasting what he's doing with typical philosophical works, which really just talk about people in the abstract. He says, I don't want to talk about people in the abstract. I don't want to sit in my armchair and think, oh, what is it to be a human being? I want to actually look at real human beings and see how they behave. And I want to do it in a scientific spirit. Well, if that's simply the base, what is the surface manifest level? The answer is that's the level of thought, conceiving, thinking. The mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux, in other words, the effect of their <coughs> material behavior. The same applies to mental production as expressed in the language of politics, laws, morality, religion, metaphysics of a people. In other words, ideology <laughs> of the ideas Express, whether it's literature or ethics or theology or politics, um, all of these things are really expressions uh, at the top level that are being driven by the underlying material level. What's really taking place, the real causation, is not that level of thought, it's underlying that at the level of things. <coughs> the level of ideology here, of theory, all of that is really superstructure, resting on a foundation that is purely material. And so he sums it up in this phrase. Life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. Here, life stands for that underlying basic level of material processes. And consciousness stands for that manifest level, the level that is really the effect of everything going on in that base level. Well, that's how we can picture Marx's two-level theory then. Uh, the base level, life, is material, it is economic forces ultimately, but really material forces that are determining things. The later of his writings are the more he stresses the economic and the earlier work he just stresses the material part. And economics is only a part of that. And then consciousness, ideas, the realm of theory, all of that is really at the superstructure level. And now that I see this in here on my computer screen, that's great, but that's actually really hard to read in here, at least for my angle, so I will fix that and lighten this up in the future. Uh, anyway, all the causes are ultimately material. And as he goes along, they get increasingly economic in the theory. And here's somebody's artistic representation of that. Marx's portrait in coins. Okay. So, religion, he famously says, is the opiate of the masses. It is really just a way in which people sort of dull themselves to the pain of existence. But he says, look, it's not just religion. It's really every bit of theory. Literature is the same thing. Philosophy is the same thing. Any theory really ends up being the opiate of the masses in the sense that it's something we construct to tell ourselves a story, to rationalize what is ultimately being driven by forces that are beyond our understanding. And this has real practical effects. Here you see a church on Red Square being destroyed in 1929. So this wasn't just a theoretical point. It made Marx hostile to religion, hostile to a variety of forms of culture that he saw as not promoting the right social values. So he ends up saying morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness have no longer the semblance of independence. They have no history, no development. Men are developing their material production, their material intercourse alter their thinking and the products of their thinking. So really, in the end, what you say, 
what you think, what you theorize, all of that is really driven by your own material concerns. All of that has no independent existence, it's just the effect of underlying material forces and ultimately economic forces. An interesting question, does that apply to Marx's theory itself? I don't know, he never talks about that question, and it ought to worry us a little bit, I think, although in the end I think he would have an answer to it. It certainly applies to ethics, and so here is Engels writing on ethics directly. Marx really almost never does, but Engels in the 1880s says men consciously or unconsciously derive their ethical ideas in the last resort from practical relations on which their class position is based from the economic relations in which they carry on production and exchange. So in other words, what we say is right and wrong, it really is just an expression of our class interests. If I say, oh, that's wrong, what I mean is that threatens people of my social class. Um, if I say that's good, then I'm really just saying that promotes the interests of my social class. Of course, I don't think of myself as saying that, but that in the end is what the real content of my views is, or at least that's what's driving me to say it. There's no point in debating ethics with me, because I'm going to just say whatever promotes the interests of my class, according to Engels. And he says, really, in the end, then, morality has always just been class morality. It's always really just what people say in their own self-interest. Well, that's one idea I wanted to stress, the two-level theory. Yes? So does he believe that people don't change their minds by punishing Does he think that people don't change their minds by <coughs> That's a really good question. Because the theory seems to imply that people will change their minds about things only to the extent that their economic position changes. So if I move upward or downward in class, you might think, then my position changes. Um, but otherwise, it would be hard to explain why it would change. Now, that means what? Well, for one thing, if you think, I'm going to campaign for a certain view. I feel strongly about, I don't know, position X. And I'm going to go out there and try to convince people to be, oh, what? pro-life, or to be very concerned about global, global warming, or whatever my favorite issue is, then actually, how am I going to do it? How will anything I say make any difference? Marx's position here seems to imply that it won't ultimately make any difference, except insofar as it actually affects people's position in society and their own sense of class. Now, by talking about class here, by the way, we'll see he really has a very, well, that's not fair. But I mean, what I'm trying to say is, his notion of class is somewhat undefined. It is partly linked to your material, that is to say, economic position, but it's not that entirely. Class divisions have only partly to do with economics. Um, you can have very, yeah. Take a Kennedy who's fallen on bad times and is actually now quite poor, and take somebody who's very wealthy but somewhat uncouth. I won't mention any names. <laughs> and compare them in terms of class. You might think, whoa, that guy is classy, even though he's broke. And that guy has no class, even though he's a billionaire. <laughs> and that suggests that class isn't just economic, it's something else too. And so, in Marx, this is sort of a, it is partly social, partly economic. Um, it's a little bit vague exactly how to define this notion of class. But yes, it would be presumably something that would affect my class position, which means, that actually, yeah, I'm not going to be very amenable to argument. There's no point to really arguing with me unless you can somehow bring it home that this affects me economically or in some other position that has to do with my class. And that's, well, that implies that most of us who teach ethics are utterly wasting our time. Uh, but yeah, Engels thinks we are utterly wasting our time, that we should be doing something else. So philosophy is basically a waste of time, according to this view. Um, really, all philosophy, and not just ethics. Okay, now a question. At one point, Marx and Engels say this in the German ideology. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion, or anything else you like. And it gives you the impression they're about to say, so forget about this question of what a human being really is. Let's just talk about real individuals. We don't need to define them. We just need to look at their real behavior. But instead, he doesn't say that, actually. And it's fascinating that he doesn't. And so, really, the question that's raised here is, what is it to be a human being? And he's actually going to give you an answer to that. He will fill in something about what it is to be a human being. Now, there is a traditional philosophical answer to this question that we derive from Aristotle. What is a good person? Well, somebody who fulfills their function well. But what is the function of a human being? What are human beings for? Now, that's a weird question. And you might think, I don't even know how to begin to think about that question. But Aristotle says, well, how do we determine the function of anything? How do you know what the function of these things are? 
They're little sunglass clip-ons, yeah. <laughs> and why do I have those? Because I keep losing sunglasses. And sunglasses are expensive, so these things are cheap, and I carry those around, so if I lose these, I don't really care. But, yes, so, uh, <laughs> what is their function? Yeah, to block light, to block the sun, right? Good. What is it about them that enables them to do that? They're dark, exactly. And so Aristotle says, if we don't want to understand the function of something, see what makes it different from other things. In this case, it's its darkness that makes it different and makes it able to fulfill that function. So if I want to know what people's function is, I can say, what's special about people? What is unique to us in something like the way the darkness of these is special about these to enable them to do their function? What is it that's special about human beings? Well, Aristotle's answer is, we act according to rational plans. Human beings are rational animals. And rationality isn't just a matter of thinking, it's a matter of doing on the basis of thinking. Okay, actually rationally thinking about what to do and then doing. Well, so far so good. We think, we do, we plan. That's what's essential to us. But there are many other possible answers. What makes human beings different from other animals? How am I different from a raccoon? <laughs> I don't eat trash. Yes, that's one thing. <laughs> what else? Yes. Good norms. Good norms. I can distinguish between good and evil. As far as I can tell, raccoons are not very good at this. <laughs> I used to have tons of raccoons in my neighborhood. I fed raccoons. I would throw dog food out the raccoons. You know what happens when you feed raccoons this way? You get more raccoons. <laughs> And they go through more and more dog food. And since the space in your yard is finite, they start fighting over this food. And so, in the end, I thought, I've got to give this up. But actually, I didn't voluntarily give it up. There was a huge flood, and it washed all the raccoons away. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in any event, I, I, ha I tell myself they're now happily right downstream somewhere. But I look close to Bull Creek, and uh, they ended up, well, I like to think just further down the street, Bull Creek. <laughs> Uh, but other things that make me different from recruits. Yes. Well, we create hierarchies those categorized Okay, good. Those are three things, actually. We create hierarchies. Um, we have certain people who boss around other people, for example. As far as I know, there are not really raccoon organizations of this kind. Uh, we notice things. We detect patterns. Now, raccoons can do this to some extent. They can detect the pattern or could detect the pattern. But uh, when I flip on the light, that means I'm about to throw a dog food out in the backyard. And they were very good at recognizing that pattern, but it's only very simple patterns. We're capable of recognizing more complex patterns, and thereby organizing our behavior in much more complex ways. So that's a difference. Can you think of other differences? Clothes. Yeah. Uh, you're able we, to good, we wear clothes. We're able to communicate with other humans in a complex way. Good, we can communicate in complex ways. Right? I can say all this kind of stuff. I can do philosophy. Do raccoons do philosophy? No, I mean, they communicate, but it's more or less a <laughs> And so there's not a whole lot of complexity in their communication, as far as I can tell. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are many, many things we could fill in here. We could say, hey, we wear clothes, we walk upright, we reflect on things, we speak, we can entertain abstract thoughts and detect abstract patterns, we can theorize, we laugh, other animals don't laugh. I've seen raccoons, and well, I live with many cats, I've never seen a cat laugh. Um, we cry. I've never seen a cat cry. Although I do have an elderly cat now who's 19. He keeps wandering around the house doing this sort of lion roar thing. She just goes into an empty room and goes, <laughs> <laughs> And as far as I know, she's not upset about it. She's not in pain. She just like, keeps roaring. It's, it's like a young Simba, bro. <laughs> um, we feel, we pray, we worship, and, well, feel? I think animals can feel things, but anyway, never mind. These are various answers you might propose. Here is Marx's answer. We make things. We produce things. We create artifacts, simple ones. We can do arts and crafts. We can also make very complex things. We can have social organizations that enable us to build airplanes and skyscrapers and steamships and so forth. And so he says, we begin to distinguish ourselves from animals as soon as we begin to produce means of subsistence. In other words, as soon as we start farming, for example, animals don't farm. The raccoons didn't say, let's take some of this dog food and plant it. Thought that it would have done them any good. They don't farm anything. And so you might think, look, 
We can't do that unless we have the means to produce. So this is why Marx is so concerned with the means of production. And throughout the Communist Manifesto and the German ideology and a variety of other works, that's a key idea. Who controls the means of production? Why does it matter? Because that's who we are. We make things. We produce things. That is the essence of a human being. Now, there are two classes, he says. There are really others. There's the clergy, there are farmers, and so on. But there are two that matter from the point of view of the theory. There are the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And the entire history of the world, he says, is the history of class struggle between these two groups. The bourgeoisie are the owners of the means of production. And there's a picture of one from the Monopoly game. And there are the proletariat, the workers, those who lack the means of production and are thereby de dependent on the bourgeoisie. What do we say about people like me, a professor? Am I just in some other class? Am I a member of the proletariat? Am I a member of the bourgeoisie? What am I? Why am I bourgeois? Okay, good. Yeah, we're going to see that these lines get drawn in a way that isn't obvious, <laughs> at least from Marx's definition. You're, you're absolutely right. For Lenin, school teachers are among those who are to be executed. Why? They're part of the bourgeoisie. Well, why? They don't own the means of production. I mean, I don't own any factories. I don't actually own any means of production. I, I do have a blender. I can produce frozen margaritas. <laughs> but, but otherwise, my means of production are pretty limited. Um, however, all sorts of people are going to end up being agents of the bourgeoisie, and so this will end up actually being a much larger class as this is put into practice than it sounds as if it should be from the definition. In any case, here is a little word cloud generated from the Communist Manifesto, so you can see the significance of class struggle, of the bourgeoisie, of the proletariat, relative to the other concepts in that work. Now, here is what Marx gives us his prescription for the solution to class struggle. He is following Rousseau here. We talked a little bit about Rousseau's idea. In the Discourse on the Origins of Inequality, Rousseau says the true founder of civil society is the first person to rope off a piece of land, say, this is mine, and find other people fool enough to believe it. <laughs> and it really turns out that that act, that act of declaring that something is private property and convincing other people they have to respect it, is what generates massive inequality and great injustice in Rousseau's scheme. Well, there's a tendency, he says, toward greater and greater inequality. The bourgeoisie, basically, the owners of these, uh, of this property, whatever it is, become the masters, the others become slaves. Marx is deeply influenced by that, and so he ends up saying there's a simple solution. Abolish private property. Don't let anybody rope off a piece of land and say, this is mine. Don't let other people be foolish enough to believe it. If there is no private property, there can be no owners. If there are no owners, there's no bourgeoisie. And if there's no bourgeoisie, there's no class struggle. So, the solution is simple. Abolish private property. You might define communism as the view that there should be state ownership of the means of production. That means anything that could count as a means of production, farms, factories, anything like that, should really be nationalized. It should be in the hands of the state, not the hands of any private individual. And so there's a program, Marx says, that should follow from this. The program is a heavy income tax, progressive, so that the more you earn, the greater percentage you pay. There should be no such thing as inheritance. Um, you should nationalize the banks, Anything involving communication, transportation, farms, factories, all of those things could count as private property in a way that would generate a bourgeoisie, so they all should be owned by the state. There should be industrial armies. Basically, people should not be hired and fired in the ordinary sort of way. That's something that has to be a private property. Instead, they should be, in effect, conscripted into an industrial army and directed by the state. Finally, education should be free at all levels. So that's the core of the Marxist program. Now, as you can see, some parts of this have been implemented, even in countries like the United States, that are by no means in general Marxists. Um, we do have free education up to the university level. We do have a progressive income tax. Um, there is a national bank, although there are other private banks, certainly. 
Um, we, we do have a, an inheritance tax, so it's not confiscating all inheritance. On the other hand, you can see that in other respects, this goes far beyond the kinds of institutions that have been implemented in the United States or most other advanced countries. Well, in the end, Marx says it's really the division of labor that causes the trouble, that alienates me from my labor. My own deeds become alien and opposed to him, to me, which enslaves me instead of being controlled by me. <laughs> There's a little meme, and you thought your job sucked, of somebody collecting elephant dung. Oh, well. I look at that picture occasionally if I get discouraged. I think, no matter how bad it is, it could be worse. All right. Well, Marx does have a conception of justice, so he does have norms, even though he never really discusses ethics. There is one work, The Critique of the Gotha Program, where he talks about norms and discusses conceptions of justice. And here is his famous slogan, from each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs. So that is something that is the one norm that he really clearly advocates. From each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs. Now I want you to think about that itself. That in is going to tell you something about how he is going to try to organize society. Because after all, getting rid of private property, that's essentially a negative program. What about the positive program? What are we actually supposed to do in a positive way? Once the state is in control of the means of production, what does it do with them? Well, this is a sort of answer. But there are some issues that should arise. By saying problems here, and I'll, throughout the course, I'll be often saying there's a paradox here, there's a problem here. I don't mean those things to be devastating refutations of the view. I just mean that they are things that anybody working through this has to address. You have to think through the problems that can arise. And so what kinds of problems could arise here? Oh, okay, good. There's a question of incentives. Why should I do something dangerous if I can do something easy? For example, I'm going to get according to my needs. And so you might think, actually, my abilities, developing my talents, working hard, that's not going to help me. Actually, it may get me in trouble. The more I develop my own abilities, the harder I work, the more that's going to be expected of me. And so I might think, oh, this is like a slacker repair. It creates an incentive to be a slacker. And that's one problem. Other problems, yeah. Good, you don't really eliminate the bourgeoisie, the state just becomes the bourgeoisie. Somebody still has to decide how many widgets the factory is going to produce. Somebody's still going to have to decide what get, gets planted on that field. It's just going to be somebody different, maybe. Somebody who's called a different thing. But somebody's still going to be in control. Somebody's going to be giving orders to somebody. And so you're just changing out the leadership group. You're not really changing the fundamental organization of things. Other problems, yeah. What if there isn't enough for everyone's needs? Good question. It might be that we're in a condition of real scarcity, or it might be that we keep redefining needs. At first you might think, I want people to have enough to eat. And then you solve that problem, and you think, well, I want them to have enough to wear, and a decent place to live. And then you say, well, I want them to have medical care. And then you say, well, I, I want them to have cell phones. I want them to have internet connections. I want them to have Buicks. <laughs> uh, I want them, I mean, I'm getting a little silly here, but you might think, look, where, is, where do we stop talking about needs and start just talking about desires? It's not obvious where that place is. And so you might think, look, we better be very careful about what a need actually is, or this is like an open-ended commitment. And it's a deep philosophical problem in a sense. What is a need, and how is a need different from a want? You might think the difference is without something I need, I die. I need oxygen. If I don't have it, I die. But actually, there's very little that's a need in that sense. And so you might think, yeah, that's going to be a very sparse conception. Surely the Marxist means more than that. But if you mean more than that, where do you draw the line? And it isn't very easy to say how to do it. So there are a variety of problems. Uh, who is going to take risks here? Who's going to actually start up a new business or try out a new invention or something like that? <coughs> who's going to determine this ability, these abilities and needs? This will be the new bourgeoisie. It's called the new class in Marxist theory. And in Russian, it had a name, the nomenklatura. The nomenklatura were the people who were the managers in these state enterprises. They make the decisions. They look a lot like the bourgeoisie. And so there's this sense in which we just trade one boss for another. And then there's the problem of the perverse incentives. If the rewards have no relation to your abilities or efforts, then why should you develop your abilities? Why exert any effort? 
There's this old joke from the Soviet Union. In fact, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Back from the days when the ruble was essentially worthless. There's also a problem of uniformity and control. Here you see a, an artwork protesting that, all the little red Marxes. Um, and you might also think there's a deeper problem, which is that if what is really essential to us is making and producing, then actually making and producing don't get rewarded in the system. If anything, they get penalized. And so you might think Marx, in the end, is actually defining the essence of humanity and then creating a social structure that's not going to encourage that essence, but actually is going to penalize that essence in some way. And here is one artist's representation of zombie-like people in a Marxist society who are missing various parts of themselves. And the thought is, yeah, this is in some way actually an attack on what is essential to humanity, according to that very theory. Marx himself would respond to these problems by saying, look, I know it looks that way now, but this is a temporary condition. In the theses on Feuerbach, he says, I want to replace civil society with a socialized humanity. Eventually, human nature itself is going to change. The state will be transcended. Labor will vanish. The philosophers, he says, have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. And by changing the world, he thinks he can change human nature. Here's a manifestation of that two-level theory. We change the social structures. We change what's going on at the base level. We thereby change what people want. You write, now I think you care more about your own children and your own friends and your own parents than you do about strangers. But oh, after the revolution, things will change and that will no longer be true. Now, let's take a look. Oh, yes, here is a happy Marxism in practice. <laughs> OK, let's take a look about, at Lenin and what really happened in the Soviet Union when he put this into practice. And I'm going to actually skip the next little section here. This is on futurism and violence. But I'll just say, I'll have to leave it to Roy to discuss futurism. Um, there is a movement glorifying violence even before the First World War, but certainly by the First World War, the idea of using violence to advance these goals is something that uh, is in the culture at large. And so it's maybe not so surprising that people were willing to go to war, maybe not so surprising that the way in which Marxism gets implemented in Russia turns out to be particularly violent. It was actually brought about by the Germans. In April 1917, the Germans, wanting to get Russia out of the war, put Lenin on a train to Russia to foment revolution. <coughs> they knew Lenin was a revolutionary. They thought, we'll let him topple the Tsar, take over Russia, withdraw from the war. Germany wins on the Eastern Front. And indeed, that part worked out very well for Germany. Uh, <laughs> in a couple of decades, they would regret this. But anyway, <laughs> Lenin was the first of a new species, historian Paul Johnson says, a professional organizer of totalitarian politics. He had as a profession just being a revolutionary. That's what he did. And he wrote a work, influentially, well before he did this, called What is to be Done? There is his, its Russian uh, title page. Here you see Lenin on the left with a variety of his supporters. He says, I'm an orthodox Marxist. He says from the philosophy of Marxism passes one piece of steel. It's impossible to expunge a single basic premise, a single central part, without deviating from objective truth. Orthodox Marxism requires no revision of any kind. I have sometimes put that quotation on the midterm exam. A surprising number of people say, Marx said that. <laughs> but yeah, Marx didn't say Marxism requires no revision of any kind. Lenin did. He claims to be an orthodox Marxist. But actually, it's not true. There's a pretty strong non-Marxist element in Lenin's thinking. Marx was a determinist. He thought that people had no free will, that actually everything was controlled by the underlying forces. And so identify the material conditions, and you've identified the superstructure. There is nothing left to be done at that level of the superstructure. There's no place for human freedom, in short. But Lenin believed in freedom. He believed in the power of the will. So in that way, he's not a pure Marxist. Marx, is, Marx would say, essentially, yes, there must be revolution, but he would say, wait for, the, wait for it to come. You can't force it. You can't bring it about. It will come about by itself through historical forces. Lenin, working now 70 years later, is looking and saying, yeah, if the, if the proletariat were going to revolt, they would have done it by now. They're not going to do it on their own. Somebody has to make it happen. And it requires a power of will. He says, parties, classes are led by parties, parties led by individuals who are called leaders. This is the ABC. The will of a class is sometimes fulfilled by a dictator. And so he says you have to have a leader, a leader who assumes absolute power, 
in order to bring about the revolution. And of course, he nominates himself to do this. So here he is on a stamp. Now, almost immediately, other Marxists said, wait, there's a problem with interpreting it this way. Here is Rosa Luxemburg, a German Marxist, who said, this is going to lead to a military ultra-centralism. Well, it certainly did. It led to a military dictatorship. But Lenin thought that was essential. So what Rosa Luxemburg and other Marxists said was a problem to be avoided, Lenin said, no, 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 that's, the, that's not a bug. That's a feature. That's a good thing. We need these vanguard fighters to bring about the revolution. So he thinks, look, it's not going to happen by itself. The history of country shows that the working class will not rise up on its own. You have to make it happen with an organization of revolutionaries. And that's got to be people who are professional revolutionaries. Well, what are the principles that should govern that organization of revolutionaries? The first principle is you've got to have a stable organization of leaders. You've got to have some leaders who remain leaders for a long period of time. This is going to take time. So you've got to have a stable organization led by a small number of people. The leaders have to stay the same throughout that period. It's got to consist of persons who are professional revolutionaries. You cannot expect somebody who's a banker to at night work for the cause of the revolution. That person has too many conflicts of interest. And in order to rid itself of unworthy members, the organization must recoil from nothing. You have got to be absolutely you must recoil from nothing. In other words, he is saying you must have no ethical constraints. <coughs> Forget all norms. <laughs> okay, what is right is what promotes the cause of the revolution. You must have no moral principles that will impede your action at all. So the goal is to concentrate all power in Lenin, destroy all power outside the party, concentrate all power in the hands of the party, destroy all opposition within the party, concentrate the party's power within himself. And this isn't my extrapolation. This is what he says in what is to be done. <laughs> First, get rid of all power outside the party, put all power in the leadership, and ultimately in one leader. So here he is in the role of that leader. And you see many, many images of him in that side of kind of striking leadership role. What did he do? He closed the newspapers as soon as he took over held elections in every organization to determine who the leaders would be, but then after that they have to be stable. Searched houses, confiscated fur coats and other valuables. Um, that pattern is more in Russia than it does here, by the way. Um, seizes schools, banks, factories, establishes revolutionary courts, prohibits banking, basically interests, dividends, withdrawals from bank accounts, takes over with military force, and uses terror. He says, we have never renounced terror and cannot renounce it. We'll ask the man, where do you stand with the question of the revolution? Are you for it or against it? And if he's against it, we'll stand him up against the wall. To be shot, in other words. So that becomes a part of the program from the very beginning. He didn't acknowledge the existence of the secret police, the Cheka, for 10 years. But within three years, it had 250,000 full-time agents. Within a year of the revolution, it averaged 1,000 executions a month for political crimes. And here you see bodies laid out. People were arrested, tried, sentenced, and punished by this group. There were no checks on power. The secret police arrested you, tried you, shot you. Lenin said, we must seek out, arrest, and shoot immediately. Who? Enemies, idlers, bribe takers, speculators, prostitutes, ex officers, work shirkers, hoarders, and so on. Not a minute to be wasted. Who is hoarding things? What does it mean to be a shirker? I don't know. These were vague terms introduced precisely to let the secret police destroy anyone they wanted. And so within weeks, there was a system of concentration and labor camps. By 1920, 50,000 executions a year. As you can see, the leadership here was quite bloodthirsty. Let there be floods of the, bourgeois, of blood, of the blood of the bourgeoisie. He said the revolutionary courts must shoot. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn listed targets. Not just the factory owners, the people who would be obvious owners of the means of production, but homeowners, high school teachers, priests, monks, nuns, pastors, trade union officials. All of these people were to be executed on site. Why? Because they were individually guilty? No, because they belonged to the wrong class. The question is, is to what class does he belong? What are his origins, upbringing, or education, or profession? People were killed on that basis alone, including the royal family. 
Well, what happened was largely the replacement of one class by another. After all, every organization turns into an oligarchy. Somebody has to lead it. So meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And in the end, I'll just go well, there. He didn't like to lose. Here he is losing a chess game. And as you can say, you can see he's operating there on the right. Astoundingly, the Western press thought all this was great. Lincoln Stephens went to Russia in 1919 and said, I've been over into the future and it works. All roads in our day lead to Moscow. What on earth did he see? Actually, Petrograd lost 72% of its population. Three million died of starvation in the winter of 1921. Here are scenes of Petrograd from that. The economy, iron production, compared to before the war, was 2% of what it had been. Manufactured goods, only 13%. The country was devastated. 